last fronts before you enter the Sahara. And we found a village of about 300 people that um, had no electricity. They do now because we were able to work something out and, and leave them with that as a gift. Uh, also, you know, plumbing was very limited and, and health and safety like you referred to. So one of the good things about, uh, you know, spending so much time there and working so closely with them is that we were able to have uh, a positive impact on it after we left. But yeah, it was very remote and uh, a real challenge. And like I said, we really did live it behind the camera just as uh, you see it in front. Um, now, another thing that interested me, you, you also were a producer on Alexander, Oliver Stone's movie, uh, not a Best Picture nominee in its year, but what did you, did you learn from the experience, because you shot a lot of that in Morocco also, do you, does a, and anyone else jump in, I mean, do you, do you learn from that experience in, in a way that helped you on this one? You do to get familiar with the location, but that movie had a completely opposite challenge. That was a movie where we brought everything to Morocco because it was a big period epic with stunts and horses and special effects and British stuntmen and, and uh, designers and painters and carpenters and, and uh, all the other things that go with it. This movie had the exact opposite need, so we had to solve the problems with opposite solutions. So we brought almost nobody to Morocco for uh, Babel after bringing everybody to Morocco for Alexander because that's really what was best for the film. And we worked a lot with local people behind the camera too. Didn't bring any carpenters or painters from England. We uh, worked with local people and, and they did an amazing job and it was what was right for the film and totally different than doing a period movie from 2,300 years ago. But it was great to have you know, the experience of that first one, because I got to meet the people who were the seconds and third carpenters and, and painters who we gave the job as the keys on, on the next movie. So, uh, Robert, uh, obviously um, Letters from Iwo Jima, also a, a movie nominated for Best Picture. Uh, you're in Iceland. Mm -hmm. Iceland is doubling for uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, What's the biggest challenge of a place like that? It, 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 again, it looks on, on, on screen quite remote. Did you have any uh, kind of amenities, or how much did you have to make things happen there? Uh, well, we went to Iceland for flags, flags of our fathers. And um, uh, when we got around to letters from Iwo Jima, uh, we stole footage from flags and uh, sort of made use of a lot of the uh, research and development from that, but we didn't actually go back there for Letters from Iwo Jima. Letters we did all in Southern California except for a day in, uh, on the really? island of Iwo Jima itself, um, which was, we might have had you beat a little bit in terms of remoteness, because that was about 700 <coughs> miles south of uh, Tokyo, and uh, we had to, um, uh, that was, that was a, a quite a challenge to figure out how to, how to get there and film there for the day. We ended up having to uh, charter a jet that made rounders to bring us and the equipment there the night before and I got to spend the night on Iwo Jima with the cameras and then sent the jet back to get Clint in the morning and then doubled back so we made use of one full day on the island itself and just about every frame of footage that we shot that day ended up in the movie. Uh -huh. um, Jay, on Borat you're in the uh, is Culturally, a very different remote location. A lot of it is in the American South. Um, and and uh, you're shooting a very uh, movie that is not at all a traditional movie in terms of having a traditional script. Uh, you were I interviewed Sasha, uh, who when he when I asked him, did you film on the run? He said, yeah, we were on the run. The police were called 36 <laughs> times during the course of filming. Uh, so tell us a little bit what, you know, when, it's, uh, when you're not working with a really uh, traditional script, uh, what are you doing besides, like, having the phone number of a good bail sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, most of, uh, most of what you're doing is figuring out where the state lines are. You shoot, you shoot really close to the state line, and then if something happens, you get over it, and then you're into another jurisdiction. And a lot of what, to, to be honest, I was going to say this earlier, uh, almost all of that uh, was, was uh, done by our line producer, Monica Levinson, who is an incredible person, and it's one of the things I was going to say about credits. It's, it's always, uh, to me, line producing sounds like some sort of 
lesser producing job, but uh, when you have an incredible line producer as she was, um, it's at least as important as any of the other things we talked about, about producing. But uh, she went uh, above and beyond in, in Manhattan. She was actually arrested to protect Sasha, uh, and the first AD was also arrested, because part of the deal was not only do you shoot close to some escape route, you also have to um, glom onto wh whichever law enforcement agency arrives to distract them from Sasha's exit. Um, because if he, if he was caught uh, and arrested and there were numerous things uh, that he could have been accused of, I think we were, everything we did was basically legal, um, you, uh, he would be deported potentially and the film would shut down. So it was actually a real risk uh, to the production. It wasn't just to, uh, to um, protect his legal record. Uh, so, yeah, it was a very, it was all about, and so, so she was arrested and spent the night in jail with the first AD because they just went right to the police, and the police said, but you guys, the, the scene was, he had assumed that everything in the hotel room, uh, because he'd paid $79 for it, it was such a high rate that he owned all the stuff in the hotel room. So the elevator opened, and he was carrying out the bed and the wardrobe <laughs> and the chairs and the lamps and everything. It just all tumbled out into the lobby, and the hotel called the police, and as soon as they got their Monica, the line producer and the first day went right to them and said, no, we have all the papers. And, and uh, eventually, Sasha got out the door. What, what they really wanted him for was an indecent exposure charge for the scene in front of the Victoria's Secrets, which they tried to get him for, for the day before, and they were trying to lure, use her to lure him down. Anyway, so you're, you, you get that. It's a, it's a bit, it is a bit like uh, small-time crooks uh, the whole time. <laughs> And I think I'd be remiss, I know as a spokesman for the audience, uh, to ask you what it was like during the uh, nude wrestling uh, scene. Well, <laughs> that was a little different uh, because some of it was staged, it was a lot different, but it was, some of it was uh, staged in the room, and most of all that, and then uh, the, the, the running through the hotel uh, was shot at multiple locations. The, the lobby was one hotel, and, and the, um, the uh, mortgage banker scene was in a, in actually uh, close to Los Angeles. Uh, it was, you know, there was, again, I, I, what's, what's interesting as a producer on those films, I had to stay out of it. You, you can't, they have to travel with such a tiny unit and everyone is in character. Larry Charles, who's the director, has to pretend to be, you know, working in a documentary and everyone, and I'm the worst actor, I can't, I'm just a bad actor, so I, I couldn't go and pretend I didn't have a, something I could pretend to be, so I was never uh, actually on the set, but I was always on the phone saying, okay, you know, how far are you from the state line, and where, <laughs> where is the bail bond? And uh, on, that, on that particular shoot, uh, again, Monica was, uh, was the person um, coordinating all of the hijinks. Um, you know, uh, comedy is not easy. Uh, there's an enormous amount of craft that goes into comedy, which uh, unfortunately is uh, sadly overlooked at Oscar time. Uh, Judd, Talladega Nights, big hit movie, got really good reviews from the critics, better than some of the movies that are being considered in the uh, awards uh, season. Uh, yet the film has been completely overlooked by the Academy. Um, why does comedy get so little respect? My appearance here is our Oscar campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize the nominations came out when I agreed to do this. So, I don't know. Where were our ads? No ads, nothing. Uh, well, that's true, but there's so many other benefits to doing a comedy like having, like Sasha, he doesn't, you know, get his Oscar, but he did get that guy's testicles in his face, right? <laughs> so, it's a trade-off. Um, uh, I don't know, I mean, I think people don't think that uh, it's hard to be funny on some level, or uh, I guess that would be it, because there are movies that are funny uh, that people remember for years and years.